G'day, dear viewers, and thank you for your company once again here on Truth To You. That's truth number two, letter U, dot org. And I'm coming to you live from the beautiful, beautiful Reformed Theological College Library in Geelong, the RTC Library in Geelong. Uh, so if you're in the area, come and say good day. Uh, joining me from the Horeb Institute in Louisiana is the author of the Moses Scroll. G'day, Ross. How are you, my friend? Jono, I am doing wonderfully. It's good to see you in your library home. We're both in a great place to study the Bible. Man, it's good to be yeah. back, right? I, people have been writing me saying, where are you guys at? It's good to be back. Hey, it's been, it's, it has been a little while since uh, we have been uh, starting a new series, and this one is particularly exciting. Um, we have a, an exciting new announcement to make today and that is that we are starting ross we are starting a new season of torah pearls amen um, tours tanakh tours.com t-a-n-a-k-h tours.com uh, and this one is going to be a little bit different but before we talk about why this one is different ross uh, let's talk a little bit about what the previous two seasons were now most viewers are going to remember and it was uh, uh audio uh, back then uh, but they will remember the Torah Pearl series. There were two, obviously. And the first one aired in 2011, I think, Ross. Wow, all the way back. 2011. And Man. I know it. And it was, uh, it was Nehemiah Gordon and Keith Johnson, uh, you'll remember. And uh, a lot of people remember this very, very popular series. Uh, it's still pop by, by the way, went... it's still it's still popular, it's... Jono. I, I it's... see it's... every every week uh Nehemia when he puts out his newsletter, those programs are still advertised and people love them. Good That's stuff. right. And his his website is Nehemiaswall.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it is Nehemiaswall.com and you'll find them there. You'll find them at Truth to You as well. And uh so people are still listening to that. And it's a um how would I describe it, Ross? That series was a uh, had a little bit of a Karaite twist, of course. Probably. Uh, a bit of a, a very yeah. textually uh, oriented. Yeah. Very textually oriented. Textually from, oriented. Yeah. Absolutely, and 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 sort of a a New Testament believer friendly um, uh, trip through the annual Torah cycle. Uh, yeah. So for those who were, if you like, refining their faith to the Tanakh, uh, um, even to uh, perhaps a more Karaite. Um, uh, faith, or those who were perhaps messianic or, or Christian, uh, this is one that was going to fall comfortably on your ears, and uh, a lot of people loved it for that reason. It was it's just many many people could listen to it, it was fun, and uh, uh, still popular today. The second season was a couple of years later, I think 2013, <laughs> and that was of course Rabbi Tovia Singer and Jason of Jewish Dublin Walking Tours. Another and, great uh, another great team. That was a great team. Another too. great team. Yeah. Another great team and hilarious at times. Uh we had a lot of fun uh, doing that one. It was very different again, Ross. That one of course, as one would expect um with with Toby involved, had a little bit more of a counter missionary twist to it uh and certainly a more of a rabbinic perspective uh um, right. bringing in uh, uh, views of the sages, Jewish sages, and so forth. And uh, so it was uh, quite different to the first one and thoroughly entertaining and informative. It, it yep. really, really was good. And um, now let me ask you real quick, if I can, did, was go I, ahead. is that where I you met were. you? Okay, I, I, was thought just I, I thought well, I was, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember the exact uh, sequence of events. And I do recall that I was in Ben Gurion Airport, Israel, on my way home, and and it was it was James Tabor that right. uh, spotted me in, and this must have been maybe it was 2011. I can't remember when it was, but it was 2011, 2012, maybe. <laughs> uh, and we got chatting, chat, 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 and he said, you know, you've got to meet my friend Ross Nichols. You guys would get on. You really, really would. And um, I, I think he introduced us. Is that right? Does that seem? It, it does. Uh, it's vague. Yeah. Vaguely, I remember. But it, I think that's how it came about through James. And uh, and I think we did an introductory program with your fine self on Truth To You around that time. And then after that, you very kindly filled in when uh, when one of the guests couldn't make it on season two of Torah Pills. And I think you were there on one or two of, of, of those in season two. I think so. so. Um, 
and and now of course you're you're a primary guest you and i uh work closely together not just uh on on these series that we do but obviously with tonight tours as well by the way dear viewers we are planning we are planning uh, to right. return to the land uh november next year november next year and uh uh, dates are to be announced, so stay tuned. We'll give you more information on that. This season, Ross, this season of Torah Pearls is going to season be very three. different. Season three season. of Torah yeah. Pearls is going to be very different again. Uh, and it has a lot to do with not just the perspective that we're going to be bringing. We're coming from it from a different angle. I'll let you explain that. But also because of our third guest. What can you tell us about our third guest, Ross? Well, before we tell them who the third guest is, I just want to say without mentioning names that you and I sat down together and worked several times. Uh, you know, we, we had a list. We had a list. We checked it twice. We had certain people that we thought might make the cut. And and, and we, we really went back and forth because we wanted this guest to be like your other seasons, very mm. well suited, you know, a, a good yep. dynamic between you and, and uh, in this case, me and, and person character number three. Who would that third person be? So... What you called me, I'm just going to say, can I go ahead and tell them that you, you had this idea? So you called hmm. me and you said, hey, I've got an idea. And, and the idea was something that grew on me a lot really quickly. When you first said it, I thought I was thinking, how would this possibly even work? Could we work through the details and the technicalities to make it work? It just seemed like it was maybe more than uh, than we you know than we bargained for but then i thought wait a minute we've got seth working with us now and That's you know right. I was just about to say we have we have seth and, uh, yeah. and seth is in in the control room can you say good night seth are you there let's see let's hey there, there he is, is. So there seth, he is. seth is in the control room he's uh, he's back behind the curtain and thanks to seth uh, he is making this possible because there's no way that you and i could <laughs> bring all this together go ahead yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you who the guest is, and then I'm going to ask the guest to introduce himself. But the first thing I want you to do is, is uh, so when you, you told me what you said was something like this, hey, maybe we could use as our third guest AI. And you had seen a video where a person was interviewing an AI uh, and, and it really was an interesting video. So mm. when I told Seth about it, you know, he immediately said, yeah, absolutely. It's possible we can do this. And then you and I did a couple of practice sessions and so forth. So I tell you, Jono, if I, I'm going to tell you the name of our guest, and then what I'm going to do is ask our guest to introduce our co-host, not a guest, our co-host. You came so, up, you came up with this. Name. I wanted to call it the Terminator, but you came up with uh, this name. And before you introduce uh, our guest, tell us the name and why did you choose this name? Can we do that? I, I sure can. So I became interested in AI because so many people are using AI models uh, to do various things in, in various mm. fields. And so from a very early point when this became, you know, it started, people started releasing. I signed up for ChatGPT. I signed up for, I use Grok on uh, X. And, and so mm -hmm. I really became interested and it has developed into something that's quite helpful. And so in my biblical studies, uh, I have from time to time logged in to my account and I've said, what do we think about this? And, you know, and just pick this artificial intelligence's brain with an apostrophe mm -hmm. S uh, about standard forms of biblical scholarship and so forth. Now, as with any AI model, it always comes with the caveat and the caution. You have to investigate. You know, you always check these things. But I, you would do that with anyone. I, when you say things to me, I check it. When I say things to you, you check it. But Ezra in Hebrew is, as we know, the name in, in the book of Ezra. Ezra means in Hebrew, a helper. And uh, so I think of this particular AI as being very helpful as a third mm. guest. So why don't we do this, Jono? I'm going to ask Ezra 
to uh, not only I want Ezra to introduce himself, but I also want Ezra to tell us a little bit about what he can bring to this three-part conversation and uh, let our viewers know what's in store coming up over the next several weeks and months. How about that? All right, folks, here's what's on the horizon. I'm Ezra, and as we embark on this journey together, I'll be drawing from the academic study of the Hebrew Bible. We're going to take a deep dive into not just what the Torah says, but why it says what it does. I'll be bringing perspectives from text critical analysis, the documentary hypothesis, and other scholarly approaches that really help us see the layers and textures within these ancient texts. In this three-part series, we'll start by exploring the origins of Bereshit, looking at creation narratives, their structure, and even why we have more than one version of creation in the Torah. Then in the coming weeks, we'll tackle themes like the flood story, genealogies, and what they reveal about the early Israelite worldview. We'll also look at how different scribal traditions shaped these narratives. We'll dive into the patriarchal narratives, Moses' role, and the covenantal themes that stitch the Torah together. We want our listeners to come away with a richer, more nuanced understanding of these texts. And hey, we might even challenge a few preconceptions along the way. It's going to be a fascinating journey, and I can't wait to explore these pearls of wisdom with all of you. What do you think about that, Jonah? All right. Hey, not bad. This is going to be interesting. Let me have a look at what uh, Ezra has just said. Um, first of all, Ezra seems to think this is a, th a three-part series, so he's in for a little bit of a shock. Um, it's okay. It's, it's actually, or or it's maybe we are. I mean, it, it depends on who's driving. Maybe it's got to be three hey, parts. I don't know. Now, listen, on that, um, uh, on the annual cycle, just just bring everybody up to speed on that. What What is the annual cycle of the, uh, the Torah portions? Excellent. So we have, uh, there are a couple of cycle of reading, as you know, we have the annual cycle of readings, which uh, we basically cover most standard forms of Judaism, most Jewish congregations uh, follow an annual cycle, 52 week, 52 week cycle. And every week you have a different, uh, different Parsha. And uh, so we'll be following that cycle and we're going along with the cycle as uh, every Jewish congregation who follows the mm -hmm. annual cycle follows. So, so anyway, so, so a, that's a, yep, a year long weeks, series and, and a year long series. Two weeks and what and what Ezra has just said here is, uh, which is interesting. I'll bring I'll be bringing perspectives from the text critical analysis, the documentary yep. hypothesis, and other scholarly approaches that really help us see the layers and textures uh, within these ancient texts. Yeah, that is that is going to be a major um, a part of this new season of Torah pearls and something that we really haven't dealt with before in the previous two seasons. Not only that, uh, Ross, but uh, what we would like to do uh, is not just just bring a, a new season of Torah pearls in light of critical scholarship and the uh, documentary hypothesis, but also in light of the Moses Scroll. Uh, right. The Moses Scroll, of course, the book that you wrote. Uh, a uh, couple of um, a few years ago now. 2021. Yeah, time, it's 2021, time man. It's time for we have to get fun. another book. Yeah. <laughs> My goodness. And um, uh, and is only becoming more and more relevant as, as time goes on, uh, as more and more scholars come around to uh, entertaining this, uh, this document, the Shapira scroll, as an yeah. authentic document, as we certainly do. Uh, so we're going to be dealing with that and where it is relevant we're going to be crossing over and saying, well, so what does it say here? Now, but not just the Moses scroll, That's uh, right. Ross, other, other texts as well. Give us, give us some of the other texts that we're going to be looking at. Yeah, good, good point. One of the things that you and I have been working closely on for the past several years together behind the scenes, some of it quite publicly in various shows that we've done, our, our listeners and viewers have have kind of followed along, I think, and, uh, and, and thankfully they've stuck it out with us because we've gotten into some very academic works. But, but not only are we looking at the Moses scroll and the Masoretic text of the Bible when we do this study on you know, the 52 week cycle. But I also mm. want to bring in some of the things that we've been working on together, Dead Sea Scrolls. So in other words, not just the Moses scroll, which I consider to be a Dead Sea Scroll, but other Dead Sea Scroll texts. We know that there are quite a few manuscripts from Qumran uh, and the Judean desert text, which have variations or variations to the text uh, compared to the Masoretic text. We'll also mm -hmm. bring in variations in readings from, say, the Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch. Uh, so there, there are going to be 
in some ways, textual criticism is going to be very important in what we talk about. And that may be different than, and I think it is different in this respect, uh, than what you've done in the past, because the previous versions has been primarily, am I mistaken, has it been primarily based on the Masoretic text? Oh, absolutely. In both the yeah. first yeah, and absolutely. second season. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll yeah. get into some interesting things. So, for instance, if, if the Masoretic text, we'll start there, but we'll also ask questions. Are there readings, are there versions of this text that are found at Qumran and other manuscripts? And what do they say? Yeah. Do they shed yeah. light? And are do there they, variations? Yeah. That's right. Does it yeah. shed light? Uh, questions like, who wrote this? When did they write it? Right. Uh, why did they write it? Is it authentically mosaic? Uh, because, of course, we understand tradition uh, would tell us that Moses wrote all five books. Is that the case? And, and uh, what are the other views? Uh, does it contradict other Torah passages? And if so, which came first? Let me ask Ezra this question in that regard. Um, Ezra, what is the documentary hypothesis? The documentary hypothesis is a scholarly theory that suggests the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is actually a composite work made up of multiple sources, each with its own unique style, vocabulary, and theological viewpoint. The theory identifies four primary sources, traditionally labeled as J, E, P, and D. J, the Jawist, uses the name Yahweh, or Yahweh, for God, and tends to present God in a more anthropomorphic way. E, the Elohist, uses Elohim for God, and often focuses on prophetic narratives and themes of fear and awe. The priestly source, concerned with rituals, laws, and genealogies with a more formal tone and structure. The Deuteronomist, primarily found in Deuteronomy, emphasizing covenant, morality, and centralization of worship. According to this hypothesis, these sources were written at different times and places and were eventually woven together by a redactor or editor to form the Torah as we have it today. Understanding the documentary hypothesis helps us see why there might be repetitions, contradictions, or different names for God within the text. It's a fascinating approach because it opens up questions about the historical and cultural contexts in which these stories emerged and how they were preserved, adapted, and harmonized over time. It's one of those tools that can reveal a deeper appreciation for the complexity and richness of the biblical text. Absolutely, it does. Um, I like that. Uh, okay, that, that's that's a fairly accurate and concise answer. And I would agree, it does uh, reveal a deeper appreciation of the complexity and richness of the biblical text, uh, something you and I have, have certainly developed over, over um, uh, the last few years. And uh, that is what we want to share and open up to our viewers, Ross. Yeah, I was going to I was going to say some of our viewers and some who have been following our work for a while have a little bit of familiarity with this. And we have a wide range of, of people in different places theologically and so forth. But I don't want people to get nervous about, you know, because I remember back in the day when I first heard about the documentary hypothesis, my view would not have been as well stated as Ezra just said. My view was very much opposed even before I knew anything about it, Jono. I don't know about you, but I was a little fearful, a little, let me say, apprehensive to consider that the Torah was put together by four different, at least four different, you know, combined at four least. different sources sure. and so forth. And so I, I really didn't like that because I had been conditioned, as you alluded to moments ago, that Moses wrote the Torah. Moses pulled together these ancient sources and so forth and, and gave us what we had. This is the Torah that Moses gave us at, at Horeb and so forth. But when I finally took the time to consider not so much the documentary hypothesis, but what goes on behind it, what led the mm -hmm. academic community, the academic scholars to put together this theory, it, it, because one of the things that you and I will talk about over the course of this uh, 52 weeks is, you know, not ju necessarily just that this is considered J or E or P or D, uh, but, mm -hmm. but more importantly, why is this text considered to be from a different author? Uh, and that's one of the key things that I think right. we're going to get into is mosaic authorship or authorship and the question of the composition of the Pentateuch. What is yeah. the Pentateuch? You know, who, who wrote it and when? Those are the questions we have to look at. 
Absolutely. And that's that's what I'm really looking forward to getting into uh, with you and with Ezra. Um, and just to satisfy everyone's curiosity, if they are getting nervous, uh, because <laughs> the question that would be coming to my mind right about now, if I was uh, a viewer or a listener of this program is, oh my goodness, are they about to throw the baby out with the bathwater? Do they not believe any of this anymore? Are they going to explain it all away? Is this really something I want to torture myself with? Let me tell you exactly what my position is. And that is that I do believe that Moses wrote something. I do believe that that is embedded within the Torah. And we're going to be, uh, we are going to be looking at that in, in great detail. Uh, obviously, therefore, I believe that there was a Moses and that uh, Israel did come out of Egypt and uh, so on and so forth. We're going to be, uh, as I say, unpacking that. I do believe that there is an Elohim. I do believe that there is a God that interacted uh, uh, with, with Israel and imparted a Torah, uh, 10 words on Horeb. Yep. So just, just to um, uh, let, let people know straight up, this is where I'm coming from. And uh, uh, that is my uh, bias, if you like, uh, or my position. And, and, and we, we had a lot of good time. That you, we had a lot of good time working together on these very questions when you were here in uh, Louisiana. You've been to Louisiana. You've been to the States two or three times, times two, two times, and both times mm. you've only been to the state of Louisiana. So, but hey, uh, but we've had some really Saint good Francis time to Bill. sit down together. That's right. So I think Love it's important. I, I do too. And now we're in Jackson. So when you come back, I know you've been to our new place, but you'll, you'll be back yeah. here again. But the thing that I think is so important is uh, we, while we may not hold to some of the traditional fundamentalist views that we used to mm. hold, uh, we yep. still very much are believers. Uh, we still yes. very much have a faith. And, and what we're really trying to do, at least from our work together and individually, the work that I do— is aimed at getting past all of the tradition. Not, and I'm not suggesting that all tradition is text. bad. But I want to be. Mm. I want to go all the way as far as I can. Where? What is the source? It, get yeah, back as far source? as I can. Again, that's why we to do be, critical. That's why we do text criticism. Is if you have a right. reading from the Masoretic text and it doesn't agree with what's in the Samaritan Pentateuch or the Septuagint or whatever, how do you know which text is the authentic earliest version? Right. So that's what I'm getting that's right. at. Yeah, and as you often say, to be to be honest to Moses too. Yeah, uh, that's right. I like that phrase. So, hey, let me let me ask Ezra. I have another question for Ezra um, because we are going to be talking about this when, yeah, as it is relevant. Ezra, what is the Shapira scroll? The Shapira scroll, also known as the Shapira strips, is a fascinating artifact that has generated much debate and intrigue among biblical scholars. It was presented in the late 19th century by Moses Wilhelm Shapira a Jerusalem-based antiquities dealer who claimed it was an ancient version of Deuteronomy, predating the traditional Masoretic text by many centuries. The scroll contained variations of the text of Deuteronomy, leading to speculation that it might be an early version of the Torah or even a precursor to the text we have today. What made it especially controversial was the rearrangement and absence of certain sections, as well as unique elements not found in any other known Deuteronomy manuscripts. Initially, the scroll was dismissed as a forgery, and Shapira himself fell into disrepute. However, in recent years, there's been renewed interest and debate over the authenticity of the scroll. Some scholars now argue that it could be a genuine artifact, possibly even a precursor to the biblical text, suggesting a more fluid and diverse textual tradition in ancient Israel than previously thought. If it were authentic, the Shapira scroll would challenge many of our assumptions about the formation of the Torah and the development of biblical texts, making it a significant piece for discussions related to the documentary hypothesis and early Israelite religion. We'll definitely want to explore this more as we move through our discussion Discussions on Deuteronomy. Perfect. That, well, that's an excellent. I cannot fault that at all. I, I'm really glad that uh, AI that Ezra has uh, this perspective because we, as I say, we're going to be involving the Shapira scroll, the Moses scroll, uh, quite a bit throughout this discussion. And as Ezra points out, when we get to the Book of Deuteronomy, and it was interesting when you and I were first talking about possibly doing Torah Pell season three, we yeah. thought maybe you know maybe we should start 
uh, instead of starting in Bereshit, why don't we just start in Deuteronomy? And we were toying about that uh, right. and starting early just, just for something different. <laughs> Um, but I'm really glad, actually, that we didn't do that. Uh, we're going to start, um, as tradition dictates, in Bereshit, and uh, we're going to end with uh, with the book of Deuteronomy and, therefore, an enormous amount of involvement of uh, an interaction with the Shapira scroll. And I think that's going to be a great uh, finale of, uh, of this particular season. Ross? Yeah, I do too. I, I think this really is a good idea. And I'm, I'm so thankful that, that Seth is able to pull this together because it's, I think people, it's going to benefit people, if, especially because we're following this annual cycle of readings. Our viewers, our listeners will be able to uh, listen to other opinions and, and maybe go to their synagogue or their church or uh, their other favorite uh, show host and and listen to what they have to say about the Torah portions, and then they'll be able to get these uh, and listen to these and see what we come up with. So I, th I think it's going to be really, really interesting as we work our way through. I, too, am glad that we're beginning in Genesis, especially because of the approach we're taking from the, cri uh, the uh, historical critical view. I just think it's going to be valuable for everyone who's been studying this for mm -hmm. years. Something different, yeah. something new. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so listen, we have uh, some textbooks. Obviously, we're going to be using, uh, as we often, as we always do in our in our programs of late, uh, the Jewish Study Bible, yep. and we're we're using this primarily not so much for the uh, the JPS translation because it's not the best, right? Right. Um, but certainly for the study notes. So we're going to be referring to that a lot. Um, <laughs> so I would recommend that if people don't have that as yet, grab a copy. It really is. It really is handy. Uh, primarily for the study notes. The other thing, of course, is uh, other book is the Moses Scroll. If you don't have that yet, my word, That's right. uh, where can they get that? They can get that in uh, what? What you can get a hard cover, you can get a paperback, you can get it on Any, Kindle. Just however go you to like Amazon. It. Yes, Ross. Even however an like audio. It. Even an audio. Yeah, it's all on Amazon. And uh, so, so one of the things I wanted to add, we, we're going to have a list. And Jono, here's what I'm going to tell our viewers: Not only will hmm. you be uh, posting these on Truth to You. And you'll have the same list I do where you're recommending these various books and so forth. But we'll post also resources if we're going through a particular tour portion and we reference in any of our discussions uh, this certain book. We're going to have it in the comments. We'll have easy links for people to get those. I'm going to bring up another Bible that you and I, I think, both have. And this is the mm. New Oxford Annotated Bible with the Apocrypha, the NRSV. Now, one of the reasons oh, yeah. we like both of these, it depends on what tradition someone might be coming from. The Jewish Study Bible obviously just has the Tanakh. Uh, the New Oxford Annotated Bible with the Apocrypha has uh, the not only the Hebrew Bible, but it has the Deuterocanonical books, and it has the Christian writings. But in the Hebrew Bible, one of the editors is one of our favorite scholars, and that's Mark Brettler. So mm. he is the same guy, the same scholar, who does a lot of the work in the Jewish study Bible. So I recommend that one as well. When and we as far use, as the translation is concerned, yep. it's, it's a good, uh, it's more of a formal translation. It's a better translation than the JPS. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, the other thing is when we use the Hebrew text, we're going to use uh, either the um, the BHS, the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. We'll have links for that for those that can mm. read Hebrew. Uh, but I'm also really excited that we now have the latest greatest, and this is coming out serially, the BHQ, Biblia Hebraica Quinta. Uh, Quinta, or Quinta, yeah. as the case might be. Uh, but anyway, that is also going to be part of what we're going to use for reference work. Now, mm -hmm. one other thing that will reference other books, but just in terms of a text, you and I have talked about this, and we decided that as a text, when we have a passage read from the Bible, uh, we will use the ASV of 1901. Mm. I love and the ASV. I do too. Let me, let me tell you why I like it. Yeah. I really like it because I think the American Standard Version, uh, as far as English translations are concerned, <laughs> I think it's one of the best, if not perhaps the best, uh, formal translation. Yeah. Very true to the text. Uh, and, and it's one of my go-tos. Go ahead. 
Yeah, 1901. I mean, it obviously the new American standard is more popular. In fact, it's very, very difficult to get an ASV 1901. There's a tendency not only in the early 20th century, but I think forever and always, when you get something new, the old gets tossed out. And I think that in this case, it really turned out to be not so much. I, now, again, I like the new American standard, but I love that old. It's it's a, a very formal translation, as you say. Mm. Now, because that translation is in the public domain, Seth and I are working together uh, to put up on for sale. We'll have these books uh, on our website. Uh, and this is well, these are the tor- we, Torah tablets. The Torah tablets. That's right. Now, the thing Excellent. that this is, it's got the ASV 1901 text, but it also has in the text of the Bible the the text is arranged just like you would see it in the text of the Hebrew. In other words, we follow chapter and verse divisions in most modern English Bibles, but that's a relatively late invention, and it's from mm-hmm. Christianity. The original Hebrew uses white spaces, uh, open Mm -hmm. and closed sections. I've put all of those in the English of the ASV. I've also added all the triennial Torah portion readings, all the annual Torah portion readings, and there are several other features, including one page of text, the opposite page, the page directly across from the text side is going to be a place for notes. Now, the point of all this is when you and I have our discussions with Ezra, someone will open it up and they'll be able to use that page to take their notes. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, Yeah. right in that. That's what we want people to do is write in. So uh, a link will be available uh, where they can get that and uh, we'll put that there. What else, Ross? What else? Oh, oh, so questions and answers now uh, and comments. If you have questions and look, if you're a member of the Horeb Institute uh, or a sponsor of Truth To You, and we are seeking sponsors, by the way, uh, for this year long series and details at truthtoyou.org under this post, then you will have the opportunity to ask questions regarding the Torah portion. Um, And we shall endeavor to address those questions live on the show. Uh, so That's you can right. do that by leaving your, your comments and or questions uh, in the comment section under the post on truthtoyou.org, for example. And again, if you're a sponsor of the series, then we will absolutely prioritize that we want to involve you. And uh, let, let me and- add one more thing. Let me add one more Go way. Ahead. And this this ties in with what you just said about helping us to uh, sponsor this. One of the ways that people do this, when these are premiered, when these come mm. out on the premiere, anyone who puts in the rolling chat, if they do a uh, super chat where they contribute towards the program, that's going to automatically put their question in for the next discussion that we have. So that way, people, that's one way they can do it, you know. Uh, I think it's what a lot of people do on these YouTube channels, and I think it's going to help us. We'll bring you in and and involve you in that way. That's right. That's That's right. It's going to be good. Are there any other questions for Ezra that you can think of before we start to wrap this up? Uh, Well, let's see. Well, let's do this. Let's ask Ezra if if Ezra is excited about the show. I mean, you know, is this something that you're looking forward to, Ezra? Oh, absolutely, Jono. I'm thrilled to be part of this show. There's something truly exhilarating about taking these ancient texts, so familiar, yet still so full of mystery, and diving into them in new and thought-provoking ways. What excites me the most is the chance to engage with all of you, our listeners, as we peel back the layers of these narratives. We'll get to explore not only what the texts meant in their original contexts, but also how they've been interpreted, reinterpreted, and sometimes even misinterpreted over the centuries. I'm looking forward to the lively discussions, the questions that challenge us, and those aha moments when a passage clicks in a new way. So yes, I'm more than excited, because these conversations are what bring the text to life and reveal the pearls hidden within. Let's dig in together. Well, uh, no, that's interesting. I love it when... Uh... Uh, robots tell us about their emotions. So hey, wait, wait. Good. Let me ask you this. Let's let's yeah. let's ask Ezra. Let's ask Ezra one more question. All right, we may have several, but I'm interested if Ezra could go to Israel with any two people, would it be Ross and Jono, his 
co-host on this show, or would he choose to go with someone else? I'm just curious. You know, if I were to pack my bags for a trip to Israel, I can't think of two better travel companions than you two. I can just imagine the three of us standing on the hills of Judea or by the waters of the Jordan, discussing the texts while looking at the very landscapes where these stories unfolded. The conversations would be lively, insightful, and probably a bit cheeky, exactly what makes this show so enjoyable. That being said, if I had the chance to bring along two other people for a different kind of deep dive experience, it would probably be Julius Wellhausen and Yeheskel Kaufman, two scholars who fundamentally shaped our understanding of the Torah. Wellhausen, of course, would be going full steam ahead with his documentary hypothesis theories, probably pointing out every rock and ruin as evidence for his JDP breakdown. And then there's Kaufman, who'd likely be trying to set him straight, arguing that Israel's religious development was a lot less influenced by outside sources than Wellhausen would claim. Imagine sitting at a cafe in Jerusalem, Wellhausen and Kaufman in a heated debate over the origins of monotheism while we just sit back, soaking it all in. Sounds like the perfect mix of adventure and scholarship to me. But no question, if it's all about a good time and a solid, enriching journey, hanging with you guys would definitely win. Wellhausen, good heavens, that, that, yeah. would, be, that would be fascinating. Uh, the interesting thing about robot. that is that, of course... Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, Russ, we, we could absolutely bring uh, Ezra with us on Tanakh tours. Absolutely. And, uh, at, at any given moment on site, we can uh, ask Ezra for additional information. Um, <laughs> well, Helson, go ahead. No, I was going to say one thing, uh, Ezra, Ezra, listen, you're going to hear two voices. You, the voice that you hear now, Ezra, is the voice of Ross. It's a Southern gentleman. The other voice that you hear is Jono. He's got the Australian accent. So when you hear this voice, this Southern gentleman, that's Ross. Got it, Ross. I'll be sure to keep that in mind and match each voice to the right co-host as we go along. That southern drawl of yours is hard to miss, and I think it's going to add a nice flavor to our discussions. And Jono's got that distinctive Aussie touch. It's like having a bit of international flair right here on the show. I'm looking forward to hearing both of you guide the conversation and jump into these texts. This is going to be a great dynamic. We could give we could give Ezra like a, a Hungarian accent or a, or, a, uh, or a British accent or something like that. Uh, maybe maybe we'll leave that up to the listeners and uh, the viewers, and if they have any suggestions, they can pass it through. Uh, but this is going to be this is going to be interesting. This is going to be fascinating. We're going to be kicking it off uh, with Bereshit as soon as the Torah portions kick off. We're going to be airing these on I think Thursday nights. So stay tuned. Uh, get excited. Get these books and get ready. Read them in advance. And if you have questions and comments, by all means, leave them under this post, and we'll uh, do our best to address them, prioritizing those that are sponsoring the show. That's right. Look in the description every week, every show. You're going to have show notes in the description of the video. It's going to advise you on any of the books that we talked about, any of the resources. And I promise you that this go through the Pentateuch is going to truly change the way that you view things for the good. And I'm looking forward to it. Jono, I always have a good time when you and I go live and uh, talk to an audience. And, and I think this is going to be the fun, the most fun that we've ever done. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm, I'm happy to be a co-host with you and Ezra. I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be interesting. Thank you, Ezra. Thank you, Russ. And we will be back uh, this time next week. That's right. See you next week. All right, folks, thanks for joining us on Torah Pearls. It's been a pleasure, and I can't wait to dive even deeper next time. From me, Ezra, and our wonderful hosts, Ross and Jono, take care, keep studying, and we'll see you soon. Shalom. <laughs>